Hi, I'm Bill Clark, and I'm an independent game developer in Seattle. Today I'm going to talk to you about some game design principles that you can use when working on tower defense games, and specifically I'm going to focus on maps. So maps are defined by two main characteristics, the first of which is going to be paths. And paths I would define as the set of points that monsters will move on from the spawn point until whatever their destination is. And typically they are defined in one of two ways. They can be set up as a series of waypoints, which are coordinates in space that the monsters will move between, either linearly in straight lines or maybe with a, a spline for a curve. Uh, or they can be defined by a pathfinding grid, where you use an algorithm like A star or Jijkstra's, I don't know how you pronounce that, uh, to uh, compute where the monsters can move uh, from a start to an end point. And then regardless of, of how the paths are, are defined, uh, you will sometimes have uh, some variability where the monsters don't move directly along a defined path, but rather move along some variants, uh, which gives them sort of a more aesthetically pleasing um, uh, perspective, in particular as they are moving in large groups. And many maps are going to have multiple paths that monsters will go along uh, that are each going to reach either the same or different destinations. And one of the things that this provides is it gives a new challenge of doing parallel resource management, where the player will be getting resources from each of these different paths and then need to allocate those resources in order to defend the paths. Uh, potentially, the paths are going to have different quantities or types of monsters, which is then going to yield different parallel uh, DPS challenges, damage per second challenges, such that the player needs to be allocating resources not evenly between the different paths. And uh, in particular, it is obvious when you think about flying monsters, which have a path which is just a straight line that ignores uh, any curves or obstacles. Um, paths, multiple paths can introduce uh, simultaneous targeting challenges where the player needs to be allocating their DPS differently between the various different types of monsters. Regardless of, of why they exist, having multiple paths is a way to introduce more complexity and puzzles for players who are, who are motivated by those uh, motivations uh, to engage with on the map. The other major factor in uh, designing a map is the tower placement. And uh, I like to think about tower placement in terms of the power of a particular place that a, a tower could be put. So uh, how good is that location for placing a tower? And that can be defined by how that placement affects the tower's DPS, uh, as well as its targeting. And uh, this, this power is then going to affect the priority of uh, whether a player or when and whether a player should build there, as well as what types of towers they should build there. One of the, the things about a tower placement that is going to affect its power is what I would call presence. And presence is the idea here where the uh, tower on the right uh, that's lower down has a very high amount of time that the monster is going to be walking through the range of the tower, whereas the tower on the left has a relatively low one. So I would define presence as the percent of a monster's lifetime that it is going to be in range of a tower at that location. And this is going to directly contribute to the uptime of the tower, which, as I mentioned in a previous talk, uh, is going to contribute to the uh, damage per second that that tower can do. And it's worth noting that um, the tower type can affect presence. So, for example, if I have a tower here with a relatively low range, it has very low presence because only this little tiny uh, spot along the bottom is going to be uh, affected by that tower. Whereas if the tower has high range, then it potentially is going to have much higher presence for that given uh, tower placement. Another factor about the power of tower placements is coverage. So this tower here uh, can only hit monsters that are on the left path. And regardless of how powerful that tower is, you will still be leaking everything on the right-hand path if this is the only tower that you have. Whereas this tower here in the center uh, let's say it is infinitely powerful and, and attacks very quickly, then it's going to be able to kill absolutely every monster that comes through. So I would define coverage as the percent of all monsters that can be attacked by a tower at a given placement. And it's worth noting that um, uh, coverage can be affected both by having there be multiple paths, but also by path variability. So you can see here, if the monster on the right has a variable path where they can wind up cheating to the right, then they can dodge that tower unless this tower placement does not have full coverage of every uh, monster 
Another factor about tower placements is proximity, which is how many towers can be placed nearby. So for these towers on the bottom that have three, uh, three towers next to each other, um, you can build a combo. So for example, you can put a crowd control tower that's going to cause any monsters to group up together, and then an AOE or area of effect splash damage tower to then hit those clumped up monsters uh, more effectively. And you maybe even will place a, an armor uh, breaking tower uh, up at the front in order to make sure that the damage from the AOE tower is as effective as possible. Whereas the back tower um, up at the top of the screen doesn't have any other nearby towers, so it would be most effective probably to be a, uh, a like a high damage single target tower as opposed to a tower that really interacts strongly with combos. If uh, you have towers that don't have uh, many other towers in proximity, uh, and many other placements in proximity, then that can provide you with an opportunity as a player, which is that you can uh, use things like damage over time towers that typically have to worry about wasting damage um, because other towers will be attacking even though the monster is already going to be dead. But if there are no other tower placements nearby, that's not a concern. And so therefore those are good places to place uh, towers that otherwise might waste damage. And so all of this is to point out that tower placements require you to know your towers in order to understand them correctly. So as you're designing your game, think about the combos between different tower types. Think about the range uh, that the towers can hit at and think about how those towers relate to uptime because all of those are going to affect the, uh, the characteristics of a given tower placement. In particular, uptime, it's worth recalling from my last talk about tower types that there are some towers that don't care about having low uptime. For example, towers that, that charge up or do very strong... Um, that do very strong attacks very slowly, if they have low presence, if monsters are only in front of them for a limited window of time, that is less of a problem because they're still going to be able to fire their big powerful shot. Thus, um, as I said, it's important to understand your towers when thinking about building uh, tower placements. I would recommend maybe uh, doing, spending some time to write down characteristics about what type of placement your different towers want. So given these map characteristics of, of paths and tower placements, let's talk a little bit about how those affect uh, the, the experience of playing on a given map. So some of the path characteristics that may exist, if you have a single path on a map, that's going to allow the player to be very focused on uh, killing the monsters on that, on that path. They don't need to be juggling their attention between different things or prioritizing among different paths. And in particular, it's going to yield a, a much simpler resource management. All the resources that come from that path then get to be put right back into that path in order to try and kill everything on it. If you have non-overlapping paths, that is to say paths that don't have any placements that can hit all of them, then that is going to present the player with simultaneous puzzles that are only united by the interconnected resources. Uh, if you get resources from killing monsters on one of those paths, you can then put those resources towards killing monsters on a different path. And that's the way that the paths are related, but in no other way. If on the other hand, you have overlapping paths where um, there are some towers that can hit uh, multiple paths, then that is going to bring a lot of emphasis onto those towers that have high coverage, because if the player invests heavily in those towers, they know that they're going to be uh, hitting any monster that comes through. And then if you have differentiated paths where the paths either maybe one of them is shorter and one is longer, or one of them has more or fewer towers, or one of them has different monsters that spawn on it than the other, then that is going to give the player a complex prioritization puzzle where they need to think about how they're allocating their resources and what order they're building towers in order to navigate it. Whereas if all the paths are very similar, I would actually question uh, whether that is actually worth doing, whether that's a good design. Because if you have, say, two paths that are identical, then all you're doing is telling the player, solve one puzzle and then implement it twice. So uh, I would encourage you to think about if you have multiple paths, how are they differentiated from each other in order to give the player some complex puzzles to solve? And then if we think about tower placements, some of the characteristics that you're going to have if you have uniform placement power where all of the placements are similar in terms of coverage and uh, proximity to be able to do combos as well as um, presence for how long monsters can be in them, then what you're really gonna be doing is focusing all of the attention 
on the monster types versus the tower types, the quantity of a given tower type that you build and the upgrades that you purchase. And so this is really good for the early game and like training maps uh, that players do early on so that they can learn what are the different tower types. If I use this tower type, how effective is it against this monster? And less of a focus on, on how the player is positioning all of their towers. If, however, you have very sharp, specific placement power, which is to say a placement that is extremely effective for a melee tower or a clump of towers that are extremely good for comboing, then based upon your game being balanced, that's going to imply that it's going to really force the player to use that specific strategy for which the placements are really designed. And so this can be good in some circumstances. It can be good for teaching mechanics. So in particular, if you give the player a new tower, say a melee tower, then you want to present them with a map where there are very good, very high power placements to use the melee tower so that they then learn, okay, this is when you would use a melee tower. However, this type of placement is bad for creativity since, as I said, you're sort of forcing the player to solve the, the puzzle a particular way. On the other hand, if you have varied placement power somewhere in between these two extremes of uniform versus sharp power, then uh, you're going to give a lot of room for creativity for a player to decide, okay, this placement is good for snipers, that placement is good for melee, this placement is, is powerful all around, this placement is powerful only in certain circumstances, then the player is going to be able to engage and try and find what solution is going to be their specific way to solve the puzzle. And this is in particular going to create a high skill ceiling where players that have a, a, a more in-depth understanding of all the different systems of the game are going to be able to demonstrate that by using each placement to its maximum effectiveness. And finally, uh, I would like to talk a little bit about mazing. I've been talking uh, prior to this about relatively like fixed paths and fixed tower placements, but you can think about mazing in a lot of the same ways. So mazing is the idea that the player can place towers or walls that are going to modify paths uh, potentially anywhere they want to, or at least anywhere under certain restrictions. And so if players are adjusting the path through mazing, then typically those players are going to do a number of things. One is they're going to try to maximize the path length so that they have as long as possible to kill each monster. Uh, this is going to make it easier to do targeting and uh, easier to sort of catch monsters before they leak. And also, if there are multiple paths, players will typically try to gather all of those paths together so that the monsters will share some section of path sort of funneled so that that way they can place a bunch of towers in that funneled area and know that they have coverage for all of the monsters. Uh, keep in mind that over the course of play on a map, the paths are going to gradually change based upon the cost of the mazing and the, and the frequency that the, the players are, are gaining resources. Uh, they're not going to be able to build their perfect maze from the beginning, typically, unless you've balanced your game very strangely. Um, and so therefore you should balance a map around the uh, possibilities that exist early, mid, and late game. So early game, you can think that the players don't really have much control over the maze. Uh, monsters are typically going to be following the paths that they started out on, but as the game progresses, players will be more and more specific about exactly where they want the monsters to go, and thus their maze will be more and more sophisticated. And then if we think about mazing as far as tower placement, again, the player has a lot of control over where the towers are going to go, as opposed to being fixed locations. And this, players are going to do a number of things, typically. One is they're going to try to create a few high-powered placements. As I talked about in previous talks, if you don't uh, make your high-powered towers more powerful than uh, low-powered towers being built for a similar cost, then there's no reason for players to ever build a high-powered tower. And thus, given the opportunity, players are going to try to create high-powered placements where those towers can be effective. And then uh, players are going to try to combo the tower types for the same reason your game is probably designed to reward players for comboing towers effectively, otherwise there's no point in there being the different tower types, and thus players are going to try to build placements where they can combo their towers. And finally, this is just sort of like human nature, when players have identified a strategy that works for them and that they like, they're going to typically try to homogenize every single map to make that strategy work. And so if you want players to try a different strategy, but you present them with the opportunity of mazing, you're going to need to figure out ways to sort of force them off of their, their favorite strategy in order to get them to try some other strategy. Uh, one of the ways that uh, 
can be interesting to sort of introduce the concept of mazing as the idea of a railroad switch maze. So this is you present players with a whole bunch of different paths with intersections that are kind of like train intersections that the player can then uh, blockade some of the paths uh, in order to sort of switch which track the train is going to go on and identify a path that the monsters will follow. And so you, basically the idea here is you give players specific choke points and allow them to sort of choose a maze rather than building one from scratch. And this is a really good way to teach the concepts of mazing and allow a player to engage with it within your game without overwhelming them with tons of, of choices. On the flip side, if you present players with a very wide open space, then that gives a ton of room for creativity because players are gonna be able to build whatever particular geometries they think are powerful or aesthetically pleasing or in whatever way interesting to them um, based upon having all of the space to work with. However, that can be potentially overwhelming for players if they don't yet have a deep understanding of all the systems of your game. So this is something that you only want to do once a player has been trained on how to build mazes effectively and how all of your towers work. And in particular, it's worth keeping in mind that when you present players with a lot of open space, it's going to yield massive variance in how effective their defense is going to be. A player that has tuned perfectly every single uh, aspect of the maze to maximize the power of every pla tower placement and then place the right towers in them is going to yield a, an incredibly powerful uh, defense. And thus is, uh, presenting a player with an open space is going to give you a difficult balancing challenge um, to make sure that um, players uh, with their widely varying maze defenses are going to still be challenged. So in summary, some of the things I've talked about today, I talked about paths as a sequence of points that monsters are gonna move through and the possibilities that multiple paths can have to increase the complexity of a map. I talked about tower placements in terms of a, a set of power factors, one of which is presence, which is what percentage of time monsters are within range of that tower. Coverage, which is what percentage of monsters that ever exist on the map can be hit by that tower. And proximity, which is how many other tower placements are nearby, allowing you to combo towers together. And then I talked about how paths and tower placement power can uh, impact the way that a map feels to play. And then I talked some about mazing and how that uh, gives players a lot of room for creativity by controlling paths and tower placements. Uh, and I presented railroad switch mazes as a simple way to train players how to do mazes, and then open space mazes as a room for high creativity and high mastery that can be overwhelming to beginning players. And as in all of these talks, I would like to end with a challenge from a game design book that I really like. This one is from Steve Swink's Game Field book. And Steve says, so space is crucially important. It's the other half of tuning game feel. For this reason, games that have the best feel are often the ones in which the mechanic and the spatial context were created simultaneously. So my challenge to you is to think about your tower types, your monster types, and all of your mechanics, as well as your map design and your map layout as interconnected systems that are going to affect each other. And if you can design them together in ways where they complement each other, that's gonna yield a more satisfying game. Thanks for watching this video. Down in the comments, you're going to see a link to other videos in this series, to my website where I have a game development blog, and to my Discord where you can talk to me about uh, my game development as well as these videos. I will also link to a Reddit thread on which you can post any questions or comments. I'd love to hear uh, what you think about this video. I'd love to hear things that you want me to cover in future videos. And in general, I just like talking with people who are excited about tower defenses. So again, thanks for watching. Have a good one.